This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Hmm. Several weeks ago when Pastor Jim asked me to come and speak to you all this morning, uh, um, I asked him what he would like me to talk about. And he gave me some choices. He says that uh, uh, you select something from the lectionary or something scriptural. And it was about that time Pastor Allen started talking about his Elisha, which was one of his uh, favorite uh, Bible characters. So one of my five favorite Bible characters is Nehemiah. So we're going to talk about him this morning. Um, scripture passage I'm using is from Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, verses 1 to 14. In your pew Bibles, it's on page 401, and large print, it's on page 508. And the word says, uh, now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hecaphorim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messages to them, saying, I am doing a great work, it cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand, in it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are rebuilding the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in, Jer you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you have been, say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, son of Mehadabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, and that man such as I could go into the temple and live. I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had sent him. But he pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sinballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be, be afraid and act in his way, act in this way, and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember, Tobiah and Sembalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. You are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Which team would you like to be on? The A team or the B team? I'm not talking about the TV show from the 70s. 
The A team consists of the fastest. They are the strongest, and they are the most likely to succeed. They are the cream of the crop. The B team consists of the weak, the outcasts, those that are the least likely to succeed. They are those that have been rejected and downcast. Which team would you like to be on? Who wants to be on team A? Who wants to be on the B team? God picks from the B team. Throughout scripture, some of those, those God picked from the B team in the Old Testament were Joseph, Moses, David, the prophets. Some of those that Jesus picked from the B team in the New Testament were lepers, prostitutes, adulterers, zealots, tax collectors, fishermen. Those that were picked by God and Jesus were ordinary, everyday people and were used to do amazing, extraordinary things. The year was about 445 B.C. Nehemiah was an Israelite living in exile in the palace of the king of Persia. He was the cupbearer to the king, to king Artaxerxes. The king's name at Wednesday night Bible study we refer to as a big word. Um, you know, those big words that are hard to say. Uh, so for the remainder of this message, we're going to refer to him as King Art. The cupbearer's primary job was to eat and drink some of the king's food uh, to see if someone was trying to poison him. So the cupbearer's job wasn't, or the cupbearer's cup life was not very important. Nehemiah's calling came when his brother and a few others came from Judah. And they told Nehemiah that those that had returned to Jerusalem from exile were in great trouble. This news deeply saddened Nehemiah. He fasted and prayed to God for days. King Art asked Nehemiah why he was so sad. Nehemiah said fearfully, the land where his ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed. Nehemiah requests permission to go to Judah and rebuild the city where his ancestors lay. Keep in mind, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. He wasn't a builder. And during their discussion, King Art asked how long he would be gone. And when he, Nehemiah, told the king when he would return, he was granted permission to go. Then he asked King Art to write letters to the governors of the provinces that he would be passing through for a safe passage. He also wrote a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, to keep him, to, get, to give him timber for the gates of the temple and the walls of the city. King Art also sent some of his army to escort Nehemiah. The enemies of Jerusalem send Balak the Horamite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab were not happy that someone was coming to help the Israelites. After he had been in Jerusalem for three days, Nehemiah went out at nighttime with a few men to survey the damages to the wall. No one knew what he was up to. He called a meeting with the officials. He told them about God saying, let us rise up and build. He was referring to building the wall. Nehemiah told the officials about God calling him and what King Art had told him. When Simbala and his friends heard of it, they were not happy. They asked if Nehemiah was rebelling against the king. Nehemiah told him the God of heaven will make us prosper. 
and we his servants will rise up and build. But you will have no, no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. When the work began, each family that lived within the walls worked on a portion of the wall. There were also some from the surrounding regions working on sections of the wall. And when Symbalat found out that they had started rebuilding the wall, he became very angry. Meanwhile, the workers continued building the wall to half its height. Sanballat and his allies plotted to fight Jerusalem and stir up trouble. Nehemiah prayed to God and posted guards day and night. The workers were growing weary with it while the enemies prepared to invade Jerusalem. Nehemiah stationed some of the people at the weakest points armed with spears, swords, and bows. He reminded the people that the Lord is with them and will fight for them. The enemies found out that Nehemiah had heard of their plot and that God had frustrated it. The workers all continued working on the wall. From then on, half the men were working on the wall and the other half were standing guard protecting them. Some of the workers were building the wall with one hand while carrying a weapon in the other hand. That isn't easy. This morning we had our ASP team in here and I asked one of the members of the team um, if he would hold a nail while somebody else is swinging with a hammer. <laughs> and he says, uh-uh. <coughs> Nehemiah had a man with a trumpet that stayed by his side. The workers were spread out along the wall. When they heard the trumpet sound, they were to, all to go to where the trumpet was and the Lord will fight for them. While they were working on the wall, it was, it was brought to Nehemiah's attention that there was not enough food for everyone to eat. Some were mortgaging their homes and fields so they could buy grain. Some had to borrow money to pay the king's tax. Nehemiah accused the officials of wrongdoing. Nehemiah and his men were lending people money and grain. He told the officials to give back all that they had taken from the people, and they did. Nehemiah was made governor of Judah. As governor of Judah, he did not take from the people. Instead, he took care of the people. He fed 150 that joined him at his table each day. By doing this, Nehemiah stayed focused on building the wall. Sanballat and his armies continuously tried to get Nehemiah off the wall. Four times they sent a messenger asking him to meet with them at a place away from the wall. Nehemiah knew they wanted to harm him, but he stood his ground and stayed on the wall. There was a fifth time that Sanballat sent his messenger. Nehemiah sent a message back saying that their message was filled with lies and false reports. Nehemiah stood his ground and stayed on the wall. He prayed to God, now strengthen my hands. God took an unqualified member of the B team, Nehemiah, and qualified him. Nehemiah was not a construction worker, but he organized and oversaw the construction of the wall. The approximate dimensions of the wall was two and a half miles long, eight feet thick, and 40 feet high. Scripture says they built the wall in 52 days. God is still calling those from the B team today. I know that's true because I'm one of them. I also know that after one has answered God's calling, that it's not easy to stand your ground. In 2008, God called me to be a certified lay minister. 
I definitely was not qualified for that calling. I didn't have the qualifications to take the training. And one of the qualifies, qualifications was being a certified lay speaker. And I was not one of them. During the certified lay ministry training, our instructor told us that when we start serving as a certified lay minister at our church, that people will treat us differently. At the time, I did not believe that. But since, since then, I have found that to be true. Some examples are people coming to me complaining about our pastors, the way that they dress, things that they have said, etc. There are some that have complained to me about various things going on in the church. These people expect me to relay their complaints to the pastors and to our church leaders. I have not and will not be their messenger. I've had others volunteer me to do things that they will not do. They, and they've done so without considering my schedule or asking my permission. There have been times after I answered God's calling that I failed to stand my ground. When we answer God's call, Satan starts working even harder on us. When I retired in May of 2012, our income was cut in half. We were used to getting paid every other week before retirement. After retirement, we were getting paid the last day of the month, once a month. And we struggled financially for several months until we got, got adjusted. At the same time, God was calling me to start the heartfelt ministry. It was during that time that Satan reopened some of the old wounds from my childhood that I thought were healed. I stumbled and fell and did some things that I should not have done. And since then, I went through Christian counseling for over a year, and those old wounds were healed on the top of a mountain in New Mexico. Uh, during the summer of 2013 when some of us were on a mission trip at Rough Side of the Mountain. Since then, my calling has changed a few times. There have been, I'm sorry, it has been challenged a few times. There have been some church members that have questioned me when they see me delivering backpacks saying, is there really a need for that? I tell them, yes, there is, and keep on going. There have also been some that have told me to stop calling the heartfelt ministry a Christian-based ministry. They tell me that I should call it a faith-based ministry. It was Jesus Christ that gave me the vision for the heartfelt ministry. When people tell me I should call it faith-based, I refer to the passage that was read by Dave earlier from Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and, 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is heaven. See, when people tell me I need to uh, call it a faith-based ministry, to me, that is denying Christ. I'm not going to do that because it is Christ. It, without Christ, we wouldn't be doing it. A couple of weeks ago, God called upon this B-team member once again. He's called me to start developing a summer meals program for the more than 3,400 Calvert County school students that qualify for the free and reduced rate meals. Right now we're in, in the very early stages of developing this program and we hope to start it next summer. Are you a member of God's B team? Is God calling you to do something 
that you think you are unqualified for? Is God calling you to step out of your comfort zone? I've learned that when I step out of my comfort zone for Jesus, then I'm stop, stepping into Jesus' comfort zone. When God calls you to answer his calling, even though you think you are unqualified, God can and will qualify you to do his work. Amen.